So uh, my name is David Sweet. I'm one of the consultants in the Regional Neonatal Unit and today I'm going to talk through the indications and how to do exchange transfusion in the newborn. So to begin with what we need to think about is what are the indications for exchange because it, it is important that all paediatricians have the ability to do this when it's required. Firstly, there's the one that everybody knows about, severe rhesus hemolytic disease. And in this condition, you're doing the exchange both to correct anemia and to remove antibody-coated red cells and also to remove bilirubin. You can also do an exchange transfusion for severe hypobilirubinemia for any cause, in which case you're just removing bilirubin to try and protect the brain. Exchange can also be done uh, for severe methemoglobinemia, and this is to correct the oxygen carrying capacity. And in some places in the world, exchange is done in babies with severe sepsis or DIC. And the aim in this occasion is to remove bacteria and pro-inflammatory cytokines from the circulation. Although that's not done that often here in the West, it's quite frequent in other countries like India. And we can also use exchange for things like drug intoxication, where we want to remove anything from the plasma that's potentially causing the baby harm. Okay, so then thinking about rhesus hemolytic disease. What we expect in rhesus disease is that we most often know that there's a problem that's about to occur because obstetricians are usually carefully looking after mothers who are rhesus negative. If the maternal antibody level is more than five international units um, and these mothers are usually followed during pregnancy to see if their antibody teeters are changing, uh, so if the antibody teeters change by more than one dilution, and this would represent an increase in the maternal teeter, and this would help to um, decide antenatally whether there's any cause for concern. Obstetricians are also measuring the baby for signs of fetal anemia, and this is done by using a Doppler ultrasound and measuring the velocity of blood flow in the middle cerebral artery and there's normal ranges for this and obstetricians can tell whenever it's increasing. And if it's suspected that there may be a risk of a rhesus hemolytic disease then it is important prior to birth to inform the blood bank so that appropriate blood can be cross-matched against the maternal serum before the baby arrives. After the baby's born it's important to do cord bloods looking at hemoglobin, bilirubin blood group and combs and if the baby's had an inuterine transfusion you could also potentially measure the fetal hemoglobin level. Once the baby is admitted then quickly they should be started on triple phototherapy and venous and arterial access should be secured. So we all know from doing NLS how to put in umbilical venous lines it's useful if you can put in both an umbilical venous line and an arterial line because isovolumetric exchange is the best way of doing an exchange transfusion. So central venous and arterial access is ideal as this allows isovolumetric exchange but if it's not possible to obtain arterial access it is possible still to do an exchange using venous access alone as long as you've got the catheter inside a large vessel. So for decision making at birth, if the baby's born and the initial cord blood show a hemoglobin less than 10 or a bilirubin above 80, then it's probably reasonable to assume that you're going to have to proceed with an immediate exchange transfusion because there's evidence there of very severe hemolysis going on. If either the bilirubin or the hemoglobin aren't above those thresholds, then it's reasonable to start aggressive phototherapy and monitor the SBR within a few hours after the initiation of phototherapy to see how things are going. And if the bilirubin is found to be rising at more than 8 micromoles per litre per hour despite maximal phototherapy, then it's reasonable to proceed with exchange in order to prevent um, the bilirubin causing neurotoxicity. If the bilirubin's not rising uh, that quickly, then it's important to continue phototherapy and continue to monitor the bilirubin as indicated and you only will need to do an exchange transfusion if you get into the zone of severe hyperbilirubinemia. If we need to do an exchange, it can take some time to set up and this is because in the lab lots of things need to be done to the blood before we get it. The blood provided will be plasma reduced cells, so the hemat hematocrit will be about 0.5 to 0.6. The blood group has to be 
O or ABO compatible with maternal and neonatal plasma. It must be rhesus negative blood or the rhesus D identical with the neonate. And it must also be negative for red cell antigens to which mother has antibodies. It must be less than five days old, CMV negative, and it must be irradiated and transfused within 24 hours of radiation unless this is going to cause a significant delay and the irradiation is essential if the infant has had a previous in, in utero exchange transfusion. So it's possible to watch what's happening with babies using the uh, nice uh, Billy Rubin charts but it's important not to get over excited about what happens at the very beginning of life. So if this is your chart and you get your initial hemoglobin um, coming at 170 but the hemoglobin's okay. This is in the exchange zone above the red line but does this mean that you need to proceed with immediate exchange? Well what you can do is you can use aggressive phototherapy and then track what's happening to the bilirubin. And you can see in this occasion the bilirubin has risen within six hours from 170 to 300 so that's 22 millimoles per hour. Now if you do the mathematics on the trajectory of that slope you can see that it's going to reach the exchange line within seven hours. So you've got either seven hours to do an exchange or sort out the problem another way. The bilirubin's repeated again so if, if say more aggressive phototherapy has been started or immunoglobulin has been given and now we can see the bilirubin has risen further from 300 to 340. By doing the maths again we can see the rate of rise is 7 millimoles per hour and this means it's going to reach the upper exchange line up here within uh, about 15 hours. So again we've got 15 hours to try and sort out the problem before the baby, baby's bilirubin goes above the flat part of the exchange transfusion line. The bilirubin is repeated again and we can see it's risen from 340 to 360 which is just 3 millimoles per hour now and if you do the trajectory of that slope it's going to reach the exchange line within 30 hours. So this is where I'd be starting to breathe a sigh of relief because the baby's bilirubin is not looking like it's going to go above the flat part of the exchange transfusion line. And again if it's repeated some hours later 360 to 390 in 18 hours it's only rising at 1.5 millimoles per hour so it's going to take 40 hours to reach the exchange line and you can see by the trajectory of the slope that it's not actually ever going to go above the exchange transfusion line provided the phototherapy uh, that you've started is continued and this way you can hopefully uh, not automatically proceed with exchange transfusion just when the red dots are above the initial part of the exchange transfusion line but reserve the this to warn you that the baby is in danger of needing exchange and to be very careful and repeat the bilirubin fairly frequently to make sure that the slope of the line is levelling off. So if you do decide to proceed with exchange there's a number of things that need to happen. Firstly you need to take consent. The blood for exchange needs to be warmed before it goes through into the baby. Uh, you need to have your lines in and you need to connect the venous line to a three-way tap with a 10 ml syringe with a, an escape, uh, a, an ability to, for the blood to be drawn from the warmer and then infused into the venous side. And then on the arterial side you're going to have two three-way taps with connected to syringes which allow you to draw blood from the baby's arterial system and then to squirt it into a waste bag uh, whilst uh, dextrose is being infused to keep the arterial line patent. And the blood volume of blood to be used for an exchange transfusion is usually 180 mls per kilo, which is double the infant's total blood volume, and this will achieve about 90% exchange of the baby's blood. And we can see in this diagram the circuit and how it should work. So you've got your blood going through a warmer onto a three-way tap, which can be used to draw blood from the warmer and then turn the tap and squirt it into the baby's venous catheter and on the other side you've got the arterial line with a three-way tap and you can draw blood from the baby and then squirt it down the waste pipe. And if you haven't got an arterial line then you put two three-way taps together on the venous system so you've got a syringe that can be used to draw blood from the baby and then when you turn the taps the correct way 
you can squirt it down the waste pipe and then you can draw blood from the donor pack and turn the taps again to squirt it back into the baby. The procedure in term babies, the, the, we usually use about 10 ml aliquots, taking around 1 to 2 minutes per cycle. And in preterm babies, we use about 5 ml aliquots, taking 1 minute per cycle. And the aim is to complete the exchange within 60 to 90 minutes. And we've got usually two people working to try and take the blood off and put the blood in at the same time uh, onto each side of the circulation. So we aspirate from the arterial line with the three-way tap closed to heparinized dextrose. And then the taps are turned to allow this blood to be discarded. And at the same time, 10 mils of warm blood is drawn into the venous syringe and the taps turned and the blood slowly injected into the umbilical venous line. During the procedure, the baby has to be carefully monitored. At the beginning, we take the first 10 mils of baby's blood and do a full blood count, bilirubin, UNE, calcium, and red cell enzymes if indicated. And at the end of the exchange, we use one of the last aliquots to again repeat the full blood count, the total indirect bilirubin, UNE, calcium, glucose, and a blood gas. And during the procedure, there should be continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring and monitoring of the baby's body temperature and regular assessment of the blood pressure. The uh, exchange transfusion is not without risk. If we're taking consent, we have to say it is associated with about a one in a thousand mortality. There is the risk of infection, metabolic acidosis, hypothermia, circulatory overload, which can cause pulmonary hemorrhage. Babies can get hypoglycemic, hyperkalemic, hypocalcemic, hypernatremic. There can be acute dilatation of the stomach or ischemia of the intestine. There might be air embolism, there might be cardiac dysrhythmias, and if you take a lot of the baby's blood out and replace it with donor blood, you can end up quite thrombocytopenic. So it's important to be careful and try and only do an exchange whenever it's absolutely indicated. And I've described already about how we should use early aggressive phototherapy, which can remove bilirubin. And we can use top-ups rather than exchange transfusions if the baby's haemoglobin is slightly low. Um, and then again, in the NICE guidelines, you can see that it's reasonable also to, if you're trying to prevent the need for exchange, that we can use intravenous immunoglobulin, um, about 500 milligrams per kilogram, infused over four hours, which can be a good adjunct to continuous multiple phototherapy in cases of severe rhesus hemolytic disease or ABO incompatibility when the bilirubin continues to rise by more than 8.5 micromoles per litre per hour. So thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully you'll now see the video on how to set up the uh, circuit for an exchange transfusion.